teeth is an initiation. So there are the natural initiations, and then there are also these more, uh, again, you, for lack of a better word, esoteric initiations that have to do with the awakening of your soul in pursuit of its mission in life. And so that's how I frame everything. I see everything in terms of our journey, our soul's journey in pursuit of a meaningful life. And there are certain key moments in that journey and in that pursuit that are initiatic. They change the way you see the world forever and you can never not see it that way again. Peter Reinhardt is a baker of bread and a master of metaphor. For him, bread is the staff of life for our bodies and for our souls. He is one of the most popular instructors at the Johnson & Wales University College of Culinary Arts, host of an international symposium on the future of bread, a TED presenter and food entrepreneur. Peter is also a theologian at heart. His lectures and numerous cookbooks about the art and science of baking are deep spiritual lessons about who we are and why we are here. He has led an extraordinary life as a seeker of truth. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. Wow, I can't, I'd like to meet this guy you're talking about. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, it's great to have you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in your book, Bread Upon the Waters, you've written that there are two key principles that you teach in the classroom. What are those two principles? Well, when I'm teaching specifically about bread, the first thing I tell my students is that the mission of a baker is to evoke the full potential of flavor trapped in the grain. So really, bread is just four ingredients, flour, water, salt, and yeast. So what is it about bread that makes it so complex, so deeply compelling to people and such a beloved food? And why is it that some people working with those same ingredients can come up with good bread and other people come up with average bread and other people come up with exceptional, beyond your expectation bread? And it comes down to understanding the craft, of course, and understanding also intuitively, if not consciously, that it's all about drawing forth, or what I call evoking, the flavor that's trapped in the grain, which is the primary ingredient, the wheat, or whatever grains you're using, usually wheat. And that comes from understanding how dough ferments and releases flavors, the ab application of uh, microorganisms during that process, and ultimately the relationship of time, temperature, and the ingredients themselves that cause you as the baker to have to make choices. So it's the choices that you make, and that's where the craft comes in, that will determine the outcome of the bread. So that's number one, that they, their mission during the nine days that I have them in this sort of boot camp of bread making is to learn how to evoke that full potential by understanding the principles of artisan bread making. Um, and then uh, beyond that, I think it, you know, the other thing that I, we try to convey, and it's every teacher has their own way of doing this, is the striving for excellence, that it's not just about making a good bread. Uh, not every student that I have is there to become a professional bread baker. They may want to be a pastry chef or a cake baker or a caterer. So bread's not always the driving force for them. So they all have something that, that brought them to our college and to want to become a chef. And so I tell them it's, it's, it's important to become good at everything that you're here for, but to become really great at one thing, to strive for, to break through to the level of excellence in that one thing, whether it's bread, chocolate, ice cream, you name it. And because something happens when you break through to excellence and each teacher is trying to get their students to that place. And it's kind of cool to see what happens when they do break through. A student who may not even have an interest in something, if they break through to a level of execution and, and excellence that kind of astounds them, can change their lives and actually maybe cause them to lean more towards that subject. We see a lot of people come into bread because all of a sudden they have these victory experiences with bread. But more importantly is that once you've tasted the level of excellence, that excellence spills over into all the other things that they're working on because then it becomes a new benchmark, a new standard. And, but until you've tasted that standard, it's hard to explain that to somebody. It's, it's important to get them there first and then they can see it from that, that vantage point. You've spoken a lot about how excellence is a type of initiation. Can you share more about that? Well, it goes back to, I think, my own 
background, and, and you know, I was for many years trained in in seminaries, and I had a theological pursuit, and so um, I was um, you know deeply immersed in the concept of the unfolding of a human soul in pursuit of connection with our Creator, and one of the ideas that I came across that really stuck with me is this notion that during life we pass through a series of what I call initiations, or what has been called, not just by me, but by tradition, initiations of the soul, meaning, an initiation meaning that you're experiencing something for the first time that is like going through a door that closes behind you. And once you've gone through that door, you you never, you don't go back. You know, you are now an initiate. And that initiation can be very esoteric, but it can also be very foundational, fundamental. It can be an initiation like kids have of losing their baby teeth and getting second teeth. That's an initiation. Even getting your first teeth is an initiation. So there are the natural initiations, and then there are also these more, uh, again, for lack of a better word, esoteric initiations that have to do with the awakening of your soul in pursuit of its mission in life. And so that's how I frame everything. I see everything in terms of our journey, our soul's journey in pursuit of a meaningful life. And there are certain key moments in that journey and in that pursuit that are initiatic. They change the way you see the world forever, and you can never not see it that way again. And uh, you know you can't really schedule those things. They happen because of your desire to move forward in your quest. Much of what you teach is rich with metaphor. Uh, the two principles about uh, all bread has basically four ingredients. In many ways, all of our lives uh, have basic ingredients, and yet we all um, flower and ferment and grow into different loaves of bread. Um, could you speak more about how uh, lives unfold differently, just like bread unfolds mm-hmm. differently? Well, I think that's probably what you just articulated is really probably why bread is such a popular metaphor and why it's such a popular food because it works on so many levels it's it's transparent to, to uh, you know as a symbol as a universal symbol but it also tastes good so that gives you like a win-win uh, and uh, it's tricky to talk about things in life in a very poetic or esoteric manner um, if it's just abstract if it's just poetic and not grounded in something real a uh, food makes a perfect metaphor for so many things because it's very tangible and we experience joy without having to have the deeper levels of meaning or understanding. But it's also nice when you can have those and break through to those because it just, again, deepens your connection. So I think that all of life is about, at least, and this is what I've come to in my own sort of quest is that it's all about connecting. It's about being connected to something that's, that's either meaningful or deeper than, you know, where we are normally. Um, even the word religi, religion, uh, religio, I call it because it, the Latin word is religio. It means, and, and this was something I never knew. I always thought religion meant the pursuit of God or something, but actually the, the root word religio means to be connected to. And when I heard that, and again, this was deeper, deep into my journey, so it wasn't something I started out with. But when I heard that after having been through a lot of experiences, I, it kind of a bell went off. And again, that was initiatic for me. It was like an aha moment. I went, Oh, that's what it's all about. It's about connectedness. It's about being connected to something greater than yourself. And whether you want to call it God or you want to call it uh, a particular faith or this or that, those are all the means to have that experience. But the, to me, that's what it's all about. That drives it. Right. So, so that's what I think you know, sort of is the foundation of all of this. And perhaps there's no greater connection than when we break bread with others. And, of course, we're reminded of the Last Supper when Jesus himself broke bread with his disciples. Yes, and that... that, that image has prevailed now for 2,000 years as a driving core metaphor of life, uh, Whether you, and it's even beyond a metaphor for, for some people. Uh, another thing I picked up along the way was this notion, and it was articulated back in around the 11th or 12th century by people like Dante. They, he was sort of the spokesperson for it. It wasn't his idea, but uh, uh, the Aquinas's of the world of that era, they, they identified that all things can be understood on four levels. And the first level is literal. The second level is poetic or metaphorical. The third level is philosophical or ethical. And the f- deepest and fourth level would be the mystical level. And but, and here's the key, and this was the key but in all of this, was that you can't 
according to them, you cannot really access the deeper levels until you first understand the literal level. That's almost like the entry point. That's the wide gate. The others are narrower and narrower gates. The metaphorical, which is the second level, is pretty is a pretty accessible gate, and food is the perfect example of that. So bread has emerged, you know, over these thousands of years as a core metaphor um, in every religion and every culture because it works so well, but it also can lead you to deeper levels, which we see, you know, like even in the philosophical, where bread can stand for a lot of things uh, besides just sort of the poetry, but um, it can it can mean a lot of different things and uh, even be a form of commerce. And then at the steep level of, of uh, the mystical level, the mostly most perfectly articulated in the New, New Testament story where Jesus says, this is my body. You're not just eating uh, a symbol. You're actually eating my actual, literal, poetic, philosophical, mystical body. And that has endured. And so that, that, that statement that I just made is what started me on trying to answer the question, what is it about bread that makes it so special? And it was in answering that question, it led me to, to the sense that there are these levels of meaning. And it's not just bread that can get you there. Anything can get you to that level. You just have to want to pursue it. Right. There is a bread that you have become excellent making that in some ways represents all four of those levels. And that's Struin. Tell us more Struin. about that bread. Yeah, Struin is the bread that's it's my favorite bread. It's my favorite all-time bread. Uh, and it's Partly because, for, at the literal level, it's the bread that I built my bakery on 30-some years ago in California. Um, it was a bread that I stumbled upon. It was There was no recipe for it. It was an idea of a bread, a harvest bread. Struin means the convergence or confluence of streams. It's not a bread with just four ingredients. It's a bread with about 11 or 12 ingredients because it's a harvest bread. It's the bread that's made in, in, in this particular version in Western Scotland, at the Harvest Festival, the, the, the Michael Mass Harvest Festival, meaning the, the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel. That was the thing. It's like in the Jewish faith, there is uh, the, the Festival of Sukkot, which is the Festival of the Booths, Harvest Festival. There's Harvest Festivals in every culture. So, so Michaelmas or Michael Mass was the Harvest Festival traditionally in Christianity. And in Western Scotland, they celebrated it in many ways. And one of the rituals was that the men and their sons would go out in the field on the 28th of September, which is the eve of the feast, and they would gather whatever was ready to be harvested then, usually wheat and barley and oats, whatever, uh, and many ingredients that maybe we wouldn't even recognize today. And then they bring them home, and the wives and daughters would stay up all night turning those ingredients into small loaves of bread, which would then be baked and taken to an early morning mass, blessed by the priest, and then uh, there would be a procession through town, and the loaves would be given to the poor. So there was a whole ritual around this bread, and, and also the breads would be dedicated to loved ones who had passed away during the previous year. So it's getting, getting back to this idea of connectedness. Again, this bread becomes a vehicle through which people connect not only to the body of Christ, but to the community around them, to their, you know, to loved ones who have passed away. And ultimately, they give these loaves to the poor, so they're now doing charity and connecting beyond that. Very powerful ritual, I think. Mm -hmm. And it struck me, and I decided I wanted to make my own struin. This is about 1980, I'll say 1981, when I discovered uh, the sort of the story, and I started making these breads for our annual harvest festival where I lived. I wasn't a professional baker, but I did like to cook. And so the first loaves I made were kind of like heavy, a lot of whole wheat flour and rye flour. And it was pretty heavy. It was an okay bread, but it wasn't exceptional. But I decided every year to try to tweak it and do some improvements. So for the next three or four years, every time I made the bread, I, I found ways to make it lighter and you know, sweeter. And eventually, um, by 1986, when my wife and I decided to open a bakery cafe, and I had become pretty proficient at bread making, we decided to make that bread the centerpiece of our of our little cafe. And partly because it makes the world's best toast. It's sweet. It has honey in it. It has a little brown sugar. It's got lots of lots of grains. And when you toast it, it tastes great. So that became not only the the bread of our bakery, but it then became sort of the symbol or metaphor of me because I suddenly realized. I'm the confluence of streams in all of this story. Are, is that bread available today? Believe it or not, it's still made in California. Uh, by uh, We sold our bakery, and then, then those people sold the bakery to another bakery, and they keep selling it and making it in Northern California. And there are other bakeries that I've been told around the United States that have picked up on the story because I wrote about it in my books, and they make their own version of it. In fact, 
La Brea Bakery, the largest bakery in the United States, now has their own version of Struna, totally different recipe than mine. But again, it's a harvest style bread, meaning multigrain, and it's uh, quite good. And they use a sourdough starter in there. So yes, and and I don't own the name Struan. It's not my name. It's a traditional name. Uh, but uh, I'm happy to see other people make it because there's such a great story behind it. You've presented on the 12 stages of bread production and how those stages are analogous to the stages of life. Can you share that framework with us briefly? Yeah, sure. The, um, you know, in the textbooks, the, the, the cooking textbooks that, that students use, uh, many people have framed the stages the bread goes through in its journey from, from wheat to the final stage where we eat it. So I call it the journey from wheat to eat. Um, they've identified, depending on the framework that you're using to teach it, anywhere from 10 to 12 distinct stages. And I like the 12-stage process because 12 is such a powerful number in its own right, as is 10. But for me, the, these 12 stages you know, are, are, are a very good structure in which to teach the students how to make bread. So it's kind of part of uh, fulfilling that mission to evoke the full potential is also that you have to understand the phases and straight and, and each one of those stages and phases of the process, something distinct has to happen. So the first stage is what we call mise en place or you know, weighing, scaling your ingredients, which to a certain extent is the most important step of all. Mise en place is the culinary principle that every culinary school teaches and every chef teaches. And it's a word that every culinary student, whether they speak French or not, knows because it means to everything in its place and ultimately it means get organized. And then beyond that, once you get organized, then the process can unfold and you start the transformational process of the wheat into something else, in this case flour, and from flour into dough, and then transforming the dough ultimately into bread. And the final transformation, of course, is the consuming of that bread, which nourishes us. So there's a series of transformations that that wheat goes through in this journey, and I think that those, the fact that it goes through very unique, distinct transformation is different from make regular cooking, which is also an act of transformation, is what makes bread perhaps the, the preeminent symbol, metaphorical food, because it goes through more transformations. It goes from a transformation from alive to then harvested or killed, then brought back to life through the mixing and fermentation, through killing it again in the oven, and ultimately, you know, sort of this final transformation of becoming life food for us. So that's, again, I don't teach that part of it, the mystical sort of part of it. It's not part of teaching in a culinary school. That comes along with it, you know, and I think people pick up with, on that sort of intuitively. Uh, I think it's essentially for somebody who wants to be a bread maker, they have to understand that what they're doing is transforming one uh, an ingredient and a, and a series of ingredients into something else and then into something else again. My final little, little quote that has it's helped along the way is they say that um, there's a saying that, that cooking is taking ingredients and doing something to them. And they say that gourmet cooking is taking ingredients and doing something to them and then doing something else to them. That's gourmet cooking. So the chefs, the chefs in our school all want to be able to do that something else. And the bakers want to know, okay, what's the something else that I can do? And, and the fact is, is that they're doing it, you know, it's doing it in, in order to achieve the final results anyway. Well, your life certainly has become something else with many transformations. Um, and your life is really as interesting, if not more so, than all the bread that you bake. Uh, early in your life, you made a very conscious decision to go beyond reading about interesting people and to become an interesting person that others would read about. Tell me about that ambition. Yeah. I know. I, mean, I came up with that line one time. I was effective, I think, when I was working on this book, Bread Upon the Waters, which I wrote 20 years ago. Uh, I, I just realized that it's, uh, that it's somewhere at the age of about 18 or 19, I had, I had come to the decision that, that I was looking up to so many people, I had no idea who I was. And that I felt like I now it's time I need to find out who I am. And so and everyone goes through this at, a, at usually around that time of life between eighteen and twenty two or so. You kind of have this what I call an awakening experience where you go, I want to find out who I am and what the meaning of life is for me, and what will make life meaningful for me. And um, and so I was reading, you know, the cool books like Jack Kerouac and all about these wild zany characters. And I thought these guys are really interesting. There's something about interesting characters that intrigues me. And I said, and I, I, I just had this thought: I want to become one of these interesting people. I don't, I don't. I'm tired of just reading about them. I want to become one. Mm -hmm. So then I had to ask myself the question: What makes you interesting? What makes for an interesting life? And then I heard somebody else along the way said something like: To be interesting you have to be interested. And that was another little 
bell going off moment. And so I found myself just naturally becoming interested in a lot of things, but mostly in people. And, and not just, no, no longer just to hero worship those people, but to find out about what drives them towards their sense of purpose. And it was all about, okay, it's time to find my sense of purpose. And that's not something you just wake up and decide, okay, I know what it is. It's a, it's a process, and I think it's a never-ending process. I'm now almost, well, I'm 67, I'm on my way to 68, and I still feel every day I'm still picking up another little piece of who I am. Uh, and I think that you have to kind of come to peace with the fact that you, you just, it's, it's a never-ending journey. It's the, it's the journey itself. It's not the end of the journey that what this is about. Yeah, curiosity about people is certainly an interest that we share. Um, is that ambition to um, be interesting to others still important to you? Well, um, it's not so much about, um, you know, wanting to be, uh, you know, worshipped or anything like that. I'm, I, have no, I have no ambitions to be important in that regard. I just want to be, uh, I want my life to be interesting, it's not so much, you know, and, and if your life's interesting, then you just naturally become interesting to other people. Uh, I don't care if people write about me or, or praise me or this or that. I mean, I, and that's not totally true because everybody cares about that. Everybody wants to be respected and liked and everything else. And, and it's part of what gives you a sense of well-being. But it's not a driving need. I think that it's one thing to, to, to uh, you know, be to, to want to be something, but it's another thing to need to be something. And the only thing I feel like I need to be is a contributor, you know, a contributor to, uh, I, I think I've just sort of summarized my own mission in life is, is to try to leave the, the world a better place than I found it and to help other people do the same thing. And ultimately, I, I would define my, I, I discovered when I became a teacher that my real sense of purpose and mission in life was to help other people find their mission in life. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I latched onto that, I realized I had found a, a really important part of my own identity. And that's what gives my life meaning. And, um, and finding meaning is really ultimately what drives me. Yeah, that search for the answers to the big questions of life seems to have been with you since a very early age. Yeah, I don't know when it really began, but I don't think it was really awakened. I, I look back at my you know childhood as like being anyone else's childhood. I was just sort of a, asleep at the wheel. I just had, had fun. I, I liked th things that I liked, sports and food and this and that, uh, and, uh, and, and made all those classic mistakes that any kid growing up makes. Um, but then at some point in college, something happened that just you know, change. And I, and I do call that sort of my awakening moment when I realized that I wanted more from life than just, uh, just to be carried along by life and just to have a good time, that that wasn't meaningful enough. That gets boring after a while. I had needed to find something that, that satisfied a deeper itch and was deciding that I needed that, uh, you know, to happen, that that was the next phase of my life was, um, you know, was the awakening for me. It started me down a, a journey, what I call my spiritual journey, to answer the question of who am I in relationship to this this larger world. You write about how in the early 1970s, when you were in your early 20s, this period that you're speaking of, uh, you had moved from uh, Philadelphia to Boston, and it was a particularly exciting and heady time for you. Uh, tell us briefly about those years, those um, very interesting people that you encountered and how it began to form, how you narrowed ultimately the path that you were on. Well, when I was in Boston to, uh, at college, I was a film major. My goal was to want to be a writer and a filmmaker. I knew I had some talent as a writer. I just didn't know what I wanted to write about. And so when I got out of college, I had a number of opportunities. I had a job offer to work for a very well-known uh, director named Otto Preminger just through a series of connections. And he offered me a job, an entry-level job as a production assistant. It's like the job that everybody is waiting for to fall into their lap, and it happened. And right about that same time, uh, I uh, was asking myself the questions about, okay, what is it, you know, I, I can... I, I, I want to write, I want to direct, but what do I have to say that I had run into a group of people who were like myself starting, um, they were on their own journeys of self-discovery and had started a natural foods restaurant, one of the early natural foods vegetarian restaurants. This is 1971. And uh, I started hanging out with them. And before I knew it, I was in there in the kitchen and I was helping this to, you know, sand the, the, the chairs and get everything ready for the opening. And I really didn't know how to cook that well, but I, I, I knew I liked food. 
And little by little, I started to learn how to cook. And by six months after we opened the restaurant, I was running the kitchen. I had, you know, pick, I was a quick learner in that regard. And I had decided that the, the call came for the film that was going to be shot in New York City. And I had to make a decision. Do I want to go work for, for Otto Preminger or do I want to stay with this group where, where there was a lot happening for me? I felt like I was alive for the first time and I was starting to get answers. And so I decided to turn down that job. And it was a very pivotal decision because it kind of meant that I was moving away from everything I had been gearing myself through career-wise to just follow a, you know, a breadcrumb trail to, and not knowing where it was going to lead. But that led me, you know, on a journey now that's about 50 years later and it's still unfolding. Um, and those groups of um, people that you were around, they introduced you to all sorts of things, didn't they? Sufi dancing, <laughs> yeah. kundalini yoga. Yeah. You met swamis and gurus and charismatic religious figures. Yeah, the cool thing about being in Boston, number one at that time, and also being in a, in a natural foods restaurant is it was a gathering place. It was the nexus for all of the seekers of the Boston area. So they all came to eat there. They all brought their gurus to our place. Uh, you know, we got to hear them all speak. Uh, I started doing serious yoga, even became a yoga teacher for a while. I felt like, hey, maybe the path that was opening up for me was going to be in the Eastern religions. I studied every religion there was, and including the food religions like macrobiotics. And, you know, every everything can be a religion. And again, if you go back to that definition, it was all about find, trying to find a way to connect to something. And uh, they were all leading me to something else, but I, nothing was quite it. And quite unexpectedly, having been raised in a Jewish family, uh, I ran into some Christians who had a very unique take on Christianity, and they were doing some Bible studies and classes like that. And I started attending there, and, and all of the three or four years of sort of seeking were starting to coalesce and converge. And I started to have this convergence of things, and, and all of a sudden it, it started to click and make sense for me. And over a couple of years, I got deeper into that and eventually became a member of a, this Christian community that was going to be the, the rest of my life. And, and even though that, that lasted about 25 years and that group no longer exists, uh, the influence of that group is what drives me still. It's, it's where I formed my, my ethos and my sense of purpose. When you were still searching, you wrote that Christianity was a religion that you initially dreaded and avoided. Yeah, right. Well, it's like if you're Jewish, you know, the you could you could easily become a yogi or a Buddhist without without embarrassing your family because every every family has a Buddhist son, you know. But if you're going to become Christian, it's kind of like a betrayal. It seems like a betrayal. So it was very difficult to announce that to my folks. They were very supportive. They were hurt, maybe hurt a little bit. They but they supported me because they I think they felt there was just another phase I was going to go through. They had no idea it might. Be for the rest of my life. They thought I would grow out of it like I grew out of everything else and it would lead me to something. And eventually, as my dad told me a few years later, he said, look, in the Jewish faith, it's it's traditional that the oldest son uh, might go back and serve God, maybe become a rabbi or, you know, in some way. He said, so I have no problem with you wanting to serve God. He said, so, if, but if you're going to do it, couldn't you have done it as a rabbi <laughs> instead of as a priest? And, uh, and I said, well, it's just not the way it uh, unfolded for me, Dan. It's not unlike the oldest sons of Catholic families that become priests. Right. Uh, and the second son becomes a cop. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you eventually found your way into this Christian order called the Holy Order of Mans. What mm -hmm. was the Holy Order of Mans? Well, that was the, the community I, that, that kind of introduced me to the ideas of Christianity. But it itself was kind of a hybrid. It, it grew out of the 60s, the ferment of the 60s. It was uh, an amalgam of a lot of different sort of mystical groups there was like a rosicrucian influence there was a, um, a masonic influence there was the influence of the Jes early jesuits um, a lot of discipline from the jesuits and the franciscans so there was a lot going on and the founder of that group kind of brought those teachings together including eastern teachings and he was very good friends with the leader of the american sufi movement so there was a lot of uh, confluence again and he kind of created his own hybrid and it was very compelling and and uh, alluring to people uh, you know, who were coming out of that era, the flower power era, it just started to make sense. Um, what happened was after I then got really deep into it and became, you know, uh, an actual full-time member of what we call it, I took vows of poverty and humility and all sorts of, you know, the vows of the religious life. Um, we decided the, the the leadership uh by that time i had moved worked myself to be close to the leaders of the organization we realized that we needed to go deeper and if we were going to pursue a sort of priestly dimension of christianity we couldn't just declare a priesthood we needed to connect with the deeper tradition the older traditions and there were only two places to go there was the catholic tradition which was a apostolic secession and the orthodox or eastern orthodox tradition the protestant tradition was a breakaway from all of that and we had already decided that we believed in the the 
concept and the reality of the priesthood. And so we started doing a deep study, and I got to be part of that theological study to see where our group fit in the greater tradition of things. And we realized that all the things we had come to on our own about religious insight and, you know, the purpose uh, was already existed and articulated in the uh, about the fourth or fifth century of Christianity in uh, what we now would call the Eastern Orthodox faith. Back then there was no Eastern or Western, it was one church, but uh, it, and it was still, it still existed in kind of an unbroken line there. So we allied ourselves with that and went into it and eventually petitioned to be accepted into the Eastern Orthodox faith. And I now worship at a Greek Orthodox church, Greek, Russian, uh, uh, Syrian, you know, Antioch, and they're all different branches, but they all have the same theology and and uh, and they're slightly different from the Roman Catholic version which split away in about uh, 1044 AD or so into the into the Western tradition we, we were drawn more towards the Eastern when you took vows and uh, were baptized into the faith there was a change of identity that happened for you yeah the, well the first obvious change was my name uh, back up till then I was my I always used my middle name Douglas my first name was Joseph um, my parents named me, uh, Joseph was my uh, great-grandfather's name. My, uh, my father's, one of his best friends from his army days during World War II was the actor Melvin Douglas. And Melvin Douglas happened to be performing in a play in Philadelphia the week I was born. And he came to the hospital, um, you know, to, pay, to, to, to see me and to see my folks. And my dad asked him if he would be my godfather. And they, and they gave me his name as my middle name, Douglas. And they always liked that name better, so they always called me Doug and Douglas. So until, until my baptism, I was always Doug or Dougie or Douglas. And then uh, suddenly I was Peter. At the age of 22, I became Peter. And I've been Peter ever since. So that's now, again, about 40, 45, 46 years. Does anyone still call you Doug? When I go home, I'm still Doug. And my and my nephews and nieces all call me Uncle Dougie, you know. So I, I when I when I show up in Philadelphia, I have to kind of like go, okay, who am I today? Um, but it, you know, I think part of that again is this search for identity, search for purpose. I, I'm all of those, you know. I, I still consider myself Jewish. I consider myself a Christian. I consider myself as sort of a personification of the Judeo Christian tradition, with a little bit of you know of Hindu and Buddhist and uh, you know Zen in there because I've studied all. They all are part of of what my own personal belief system is, uh, but it's most articulated and expressed through now through the Eastern Orthodox theology. So when you had taken vows and you had uh, adopted this new identity and you had renounced the world to some extent, but still were part of the world and in the world, uh, you found your way to San Francisco and operated a place called Brother Juniper's Cafe. Right, and that was uh, San Francisco and the Bay Area was the headquarters of this uh, organization, the Holy Order of Mans, which no longer exists, as I said, and before it, uh, before it actually faded out of existence totally and all the members kind of scattered to the winds to pursue their personal missions, uh, we had changed the name to the to Christ the Savior Brotherhood. That was when we became Eastern Orthodox, which is more of a traditional name than, than an order. Orders are Catholic terms, whereas uh, we were now a brotherhood. Um, and my wife, who I met in the brotherhood, she's, she happened to also be a good cook. We both had, had cooking skills, and so we decided to start a little ministry, that, and we called it Brother Juniper's Cafe because Brother Juniper was... His, well, there's a lot of legends about him. He was one of the early uh, Franciscan monks, one of the first followers of St. Francis. So like Brother Sun, Sister Moon era, you know, he was like the guy. And he was the guy that was always getting into trouble because he was he was kind of a simpleton. He was always giving things away. As poor as those brothers were, they had a few possessions. And his thing was, was we're not supposed to have anything. So he gave everything away. So he became sort of the symbol of generosity of spirit. And so we named our cafe after him. And the idea was was to serve really good food, no preaching, no you know it wasn't a place where people came to be evangelized. We weren't evangelicals; we were service oriented uh, Christians, not evangelical Christians. And so we just felt like we were feeding their bodies and their souls, but we weren't pre giving them sermons. And and the public really appreciated that, and a lot of them would let their kids come to work for us. And we were creating jobs and commerce, and at the same time, we were trying out a lot of our food ideas to see if any of them could provide a livelihood for members of our community where nobody was really making, you know, we, we all held all things in common. We didn't own anything. And so we needed revenue streams and that was one of them. We didn't like, we didn't ask for donations. We just felt like we had to earn our way. And so the restaurant became that. And out of that, 
bread, the bread that we were making sort of broke from the pack and we became really known for the breads. By then, I had perfected the Struan bread by this, by the opening of the restaurant. I had nailed it to where I wanted it to be and other breads. And, and before long, I knew, uh, I knew how to do bread, uh, self-taught. I still wasn't, you know, an ex- uh, artisan baker, so to speak, but I wrote a book about it. And that's where that early training as a filmmaker came in. I finally knew what I had to say. I, I, I knew I could write. Now I had something to write about. And my first book was called uh, Brother Juniper's Bread Book, um, slow rise as method and metaphor and I wrote about this notion of that slow rising bread always makes better bread and that became the starting point for my writing career and actually I'm now uh, uh, I've done 11 books now amazingly um, and I just just last week got word that I've got a contract coming for a 12th so I'm, so the writing is really working out very nicely for me and it, finally, it only took me you know 25 years and now 50 years later to finally you know be able to amass you know to put all those pieces together Circling back to those days when you might have gone to film school. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so, so nothing goes to waste, you know. <laughs> so a day came when you were no longer Doug, uh, no longer Brother Peter, but you became Chef Peter Reinhardt. Uh, you renounced your vows and re-entered the world, and here you are. Um, <laughs> what did you learn about yourself during those um, moments of transformation that also allude to the metaphor of the bread that you bake? Well, that's a deep question. That's, that, you know, this... The, the part of the, the challenge is that, you know, to talk about a lot of these things, it's it, it's hard because as soon as you start talking about it, it doesn't feel real anymore. It just feels like, you know, you just talk. Um, but I think that a lot of it had to do with, well, as the pieces of my journey came together, I started to realize that what is at the core of it all is this notion and what maybe why I was drawn to the Eastern religions before I was drawn back to Western religions is because in, the, in modern day Western religions, you don't hear much talk about uh, uh, the uh, unity with God, you know, becoming one with God, experiencing God realization. Those are Eastern concepts. Um, and it wasn't until I met this brotherhood where they talked about that, that, that is possible that I thought that it could actually be an attainable reality. So I was driven to this notion that, that if we're all created by something that we call God or a creator, uh, then there must be some way to get connected to that creator because we, if we're connect, if we're created by something that is that goes that transcends creation, how do we how do we bridge that? And so this idea of transcendence and imminence, all that stuff, was, was working to me. And uh, then I found that within the tradition, the the uh, uh, ancient Christian tradition, or the you know what we now call the Orthodox tradition, there's this notion called theosis, and that's really the driving core principle of Christian mystical theology, meaning, and by mystical meaning, that it is possible to have uh, an experience of oneness with God, not just an idea of oneness, but to actually experience it while you're living in this life, to experience a connection that's so real that you know you're not just, it's no longer just an act of faith, but it's through faith that you're able to get to this place where you actually experience it. So it's all about experience. And and so I started to put, again, those pieces together and realize that what's keeping my drive going and maybe at the bottom of it all is to try to help people find, to get on their own theostic questions, this notion that, you, that we all exist as the image and likeness of our creator, that that's really was the, the deepest theological message of, of Christ. And it's really the deepest theological message of every religion, not just Christianity, of Islam, of Buddhism, everything, is that the, at, the, at the core... We have we are we are directly connected to our Creator, and I think that's been lost. And so, if there's going to be any kind of final circle around to be able, and it's the hardest thing to write about directly because people just don't want to hear it directly. They want to hear about it through metaphors. They want to hear about it through bread. I, I wrote a book that, mo- that like bread upon the waters that talks about it as directly as I can get, and that's the that sold the fewest copies of any book I ever wrote. It's the bread books that sell because people want it through metaphors. Remember that mo- movie, the Il Postino, the Postman, and 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 the young guy says to the to the uh, to the postman, how you know, teach me how to woo this girl, and, and he says, everyone loves metaphors. You speak have to speak through metaphors, and I realize that's the truth. So he likely said it with a very thick Italian <laughs> accent. Thick, yeah, but it was a great. I, when he said it, I went, that's it. Meta- that's it's right. all about metaphors. Well, speaking of that's it, uh, <laughs> I want to conclude with one final question, which is really about that that's it moment in life. Uh, you wrote, I am still seeking the great, eternal, ongoing, immortal epiphany are you closer to finding it peter 
There was somebody told me this uh, along the way. There was a famous mystical saint named Saint Anthony of the Desert, one of the earliest saints of the Christian Church. Um, and he lived in the desert. He was a hermit, and everybody would come looking for him and find him. And uh, and he was like the wise man. He was kind of the Christian version of the guru up on the on, on that hill. And and when they, somebody found him, they said. Uh, they said, uh, you know, have you, how did, how, have you had direct encounters? Have you found God? And he says, in my, in my 50 years living in the desert, I've had five moments when I, when I think I encountered God, you know, when I had a, that moment, five. And they said, that's all just five. He says, oh, those five keep you going, <laughs> you know. And, and so there have been times in my life, and I think everyone has these times, where, you, where something happens. So I'll call it a moment of sacramental magic happens, and you realize that, it's all real, but you, it's hard to live in that moment, you know. And that's our part of the the exercise, the spiritual practice, is to how do we stay in that moment? And we don't. We we fall out of that moment all the time. And when we're not in that moment, you start to want. You start. You can doubt that it ever happened. But if you've had enough convincing experiences, you just keep going forward because there's no turning back. An initiation is an initiation. You just go, don't go back through that door again. And uh, sometimes that's the only thing that keeps you going forward is knowing I can't go back. I know too much now. I've got to keep going forward. Thank you, Peter. My pleasure. Thank you. Peter Reinhardt is one of the world's leading authorities on bread. He is a baker, educator, and author. His books include Sacramental Magic in a Small Town Cafe, the James Beard Award-winning The Bread Baker's Apprentice, American Pie, My Search for the Perfect Pizza, and Bread Revolution. And now, a personal word. This is the first episode of what I hope will be a long-term series interviewing fascinating people about their lives. I've always been curious about people, who they really are, what they desire, what matters most to them and why. Every person has a story. I enjoy discovering that story. This show has a mission. The mission is to contribute to a more humane world. The show does so by valuing truth and beauty, by paying attention, by honoring thoughtful conversation and meaningful connection. There is a philosophy that guides this show a set of beliefs that frame the questions I ask. I believe we attract into the world who we are. I believe love is well-considered creativity. I believe fulfillment is living our purpose well for others. I believe ideas define the future. I believe the arts are a vessel of our humanity. I believe our beliefs should be questioned. I invite you to support the mission and vision of this podcast. I would like to thank my teammates who are helping launch the show, Andy Go, audio engineer, and Chris Curriton, art direction and design, both of whom are remarkable partners. I am deeply grateful to them, and I'm grateful to you. Thank you, listeners and co-creators of what this show will become. <laughs>